fair amount with stuff. So I wanted to thank uh, the people at Manila. They, the way this, this happened was that they emailed us and said, hey, we have a really good event uh, we want to do, and would you guys want to want to help out? And we said, sure. So they basically ran this and just sort of gave us the whole program and offered to host it. And so I wanted to say thank you to the people from Manila. Raise your hands. Where are you guys? All right. And uh, Jim, I'm going to turn it over to Jim Jones from, uh, from Manila. He was the one who helped uh, organize this. And uh, oh, by the way, a couple things. We have a bunch more uh, meetups meet coming up. So next week, this was a special event. We still have a regular monthly one next week. That's going to be on CSS, Java, and, 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 and one, one other speaker. And then we've got two other uh, in uh, September and October. So just check the uh, event page, and you'll see. Sign up. we got some great hosts, uh, Climate, One King's Lane, and Bill Float. So take a look at the event page. All right, Jim. All right, thanks, you guys, everyone, for showing up and coming out. Uh, just a few things before we kick it off with Ben's presentation. Um, bathrooms are out in the hallway here. Should be open. We've got mics here in this room, and then there's also a spillover room in the back, which also has a microphone. And so if you have any questions during any of these sessions, you can just go ahead and approach the mic, and we'll do our best to call on that question. And we're going to try and keep it as free form as possible. So um, if you want to interject something, and uh, you should go ahead and, and do so. And also, just wanted to mention um, a little bit what Manila does. We're basically like an online um, account organizer. So if you have your, your Comcast, your Verizon, your Wells Fargo bills, we basically have uh, an aggregation system that'll show you all of your balances, all of your bill uh, due dates and such in one convenient location. And we are hiring. We are actively looking for Rails engineers and Java engineers who are looking to learn Rails. So um, if you're interested, it's a wonderful place to work. So I'll just hand it on over to Ben, and he'll start his presentation. Thank you. <clears throat> Bear with me one sec. Let me get set up here. Okay, everyone, can you hear me okay? Everyone good? Okay. Um, so just at any point in time, like Jim said, just jump in if you have questions or things you want to uh, discuss and kind of we'll go free form like that. Um, we are running a little bit behind schedule and, you know, we don't want to piss off David. So um, <laughs> let's just get started. So uh, at Manila, uh, uh, I'm a developer here at Manila. I'm part of the our Rails team. Um, so Essentially, what I'm going to give a talk on is, you know, how we're pushing forward with uh, some some client side work um, with Backbone in particular. Um, but really, what what we wanted to kind of understand, and what I think a lot of you guys are here for, is, you know, these are really interesting things, and it's like, why are we talking about these kind of things? So, JavaScript is, you know, it's just plowing ahead. Like, what's happened? And like in last year, we got like this renaissance and revolution of JavaScript. You know, like even Node right now has more active and people following it on GitHub than Rails even, right? So, you know, these things are kind of crazy events. Or, you know, like we have these client-side libraries that are, you know, getting these giant amounts of funding. And these the development of these projects are just going to push ahead, right? So, um, or maybe you're even just reading blogs and you're looking at, <clears throat> or you were at the last Rails uh, meetup and you're, you're listening to people talk about migrating your entire apps over to Backbone or other client-side libraries. Um, or maybe you're even just pressured by, you know, the words from above of DHH telling you, you got to do PJAX or something, or some client-side library. Or then you read his next post, and he's just like, you know, you guys doing JavaScript MVC, it's just, it's just garbage. So <laughs> we're all over the place here. So um, <clears throat> what, what are you looking for when you're looking at these client-side, you know, frameworks? I mean, you've got Backbone, but I mean, there's a couple others, right? I mean, how many are there even today, right? And most of these aren't even in 1.0 yet, save for some of our old favorites, you know, jQuery and Prototype and YUI. And, you know, they're just gaining this, this steam. 
Um, and so I've taken it upon myself to kind of look at this and, and, and just to give you a little intro here. Um, so there's this, this is a hype chart essentially. Um, and so just taking a look, it's pretty obvious what's going on. You got a peak of inflated expectations and then this awesomely named trough of disillusionment. <clears throat> and then later, if you survive all of this, you get to this plateau of productivity. Um, so nowadays we have these client side fr frameworks which are just building and building and building. And you know, we're getting all this hype and you know, these, these frames are just leading the way. Um, and we have you know jQuery, you know, not exactly applicable to the frameworks like Backbone and Ember and Batman and some of the other ones. But you know, jQuery is really leading the way. They're on over you know 50% of all websites, of like the top 100,000 websites. So, um, and then people, you know, not to say that people in the trough of disillusionment are you know bad frameworks. It's just they haven't been adopted and picked up as much as some of the ones that are out in front. Um, so. Given that these guys are, you know, all inflated and they're up at the top and everyone's talking about them, and, you know, there's dozens of these these out there, you know, is it time for all of us to go all in? Is it time for us? That didn't work at all. Oh, it's on my computer. All right, so is it time for us to go all in? Like, should you be just turning your Rails app into this giant RESTful API? Is that it? Thank you. <laughs> um, so we had, and, and we have the same problem in Manila. We see all this hype and all this talk and, you know, Maybe you know it's time we should start thinking about this. But you know what this really boiled down to us was um, a particular use case. So I'm just going to do a quick uh, a quick video actually. So we have this particular part of our site, um, and you may have a problem similar to this um, or not. I mean, you can probably extract this to something in your own in your own framework. So we have this ability to add counts to your uh, Manila account. So what I'm doing here is just clicking on a couple different uh, providers. So these are just regular websites. Um, and this part, you know, it's a little bit smooth. We got some JavaScript going on there. Um, and you're just adding these. And then when you come to this page over here, you're actually putting in your credentials. So we're going to go and grab your information for these sites. So what's happening here is you're entering your information, but really <clears throat> nothing's happening. You see account information entered. Was abrupt, but um, so you see your account information entered, but uh, you don't really see a lot of feedback. So that brings me to my second demo. Our usability guys said, you know, it doesn't really allow the user to connect to what's happening. You know, they see it entered, but you know, a lot of things can go wrong, and this is a lot of the stuff we deal with day to day. Your your credentials could be wrong. Maybe the site went down, and there's a lot of things we have to react to. So they they you know went into their dreaming state, and they were like, well, wouldn't it be cool if? And so now we have to support some sort of features which enable the user to see a more seamless transition when they're linking their accounts. And so us guys in the development were like, well, that's cool. Um, how are we going to do this? So today we have a lot of JavaScript, but we just use basic jQuery and a couple little libraries. Um, so this to us was pretty interesting. So what this had us. What this had us look at, oh, that was a fail. Bear with me. All right, so what does this look like to us? So we looked at this and we're saying, well, actually, this is going to make us have to synchronize a lot of our back end models, right? So you see these states updating, it's very dynamic. Um, but those models are driving you know, a lot of these different view states. So there's, there's things transitioning on the page. There's live updating, like that's no refreshing happening. Um, so there's a lot of stuff you have to manage there. And how do you even get that data? Um, well, we have a, already had a system of polling, um, but we actually have to integrate that into here. And to make this all, you know, a lot more seamless and, and simple, we had to progress. So, and we also had to make it easily testable because, you know, now that you have all this JavaScript, you know, muddling in your views, how are you gonna make sure that it's actually working correctly? How are you gonna verify that? I mean, that's really important for us as our team goes on, you know, especially when someone else jumps in there, they're like, well, how do I ensure that when I add this, it's still gonna work in all the cases that you guys thought of. <clears throat> and then finally, when we were also thinking of this design, we had to have a discussion. So th this is a full team thing that, that we kind of had to get on board with and we had to kind of commit to it because, you know, if you go ahead and, and build this framework, you, you need to make sure that everyone is gonna go for that knowledge transfer. Everyone's gonna wanna go and, and understand it and build a better product or and build the, that better system for you. <clears throat> so in the end, out of all of those frameworks, 
Um, we chose Backbone, but really slowly. So the idea was, you know, this is a proof of concept. We're not turning our entire site into a single page app. Um, it's really, <laughs> it was really important for us that back, Backbone was so flexible in the way you can use it. In fact, you really don't have any way that you really have to use it. Um, so following a lot of conventions that were laid out on their website was really important for us. Um, but you know, we, we looked at a lot of like, what other people were doing, and they were all just going to single page applications. So it was really important for us to kind of go ahead and do it slowly and do it you know, in a controlled manner, essentially. So let's just talk a little bit back end about what Backbone is, just to kind of get over it. So <clears throat> there's events. So events are really the communication between your components. Um, and really, the events in Backbone are just a wrapper for your basic jQuery events. You have your on, off, and your bind. Um, <clears throat> so that's your basics of events. I mean, there's only five objects here that we're talking about. You have your models in Backbone. So models are your simple communication. They really mimic uh, the way Active Record talks to your database. Um, your models in Backbone use your RESTful API to connect to your backend. <clears throat> you have collections. Uh, collections is a wrapper for most models. It's an ordered set, um, but it can also communicate to your API. <clears throat> so your views, I think this, these are one, some of the more in, really interesting components. So the view is a logical representation. So it's a pretty important component when we were building. Um, and it's essentially a wrapper for one particular piece of UI logic. Things happen, and this view is responsible for making sure that it manages everything happening there. And finally, there's a router. So for single page applications, the router is really important because obviously you change your location, and then you want the page to do something. So routers are the mapping there. And that is pretty synonymous with Rails routes and a little bit of controllers. Um, so when we were building this, we took these to heart. And then we said, well, OK, let's just try and look at the principles and the things that we know <laughs> and try to make sure that we can use this in a very controlled manner. So we'll go through some of the ways that we utilize that. So the first question we had to make sure was, are we really a single page app? Like, do you really need that kind of functionality? Does every call to the server need to be some sort of JSON API? Do you need your HTML? Because you lose a lot of stuff that Rails gives you. Rails is a great framework. It has you know, form helpers, like things you, you just take for granted every day. And when you're in your view, and you're now trying to render something with Backbone, you're like, whoops. You know, you're missing out. So <clears throat> we thought that was really important to make sure that you make that distinction. Um, basics, basics, basics. Organization, you know, get everything in, in the right place. So this is a basic structure. This isn't really anything terribly new. But um, for us, it was really important. We segmented this away from our, external, our other JavaScript. Um, and we kind of built it out from there. Um, collection models, views, folders, so you know, that's pretty basic. <clears throat> All right, so when you're pulling data down into your models, it was really important to keep all that minimal. You, you don't want to mimic stuff on the server side. You have to make those conscious decisions. When you're, you're, there's so many actions that you can do on the view with that data. You know, you could do tons of stuff. You can, you know, uh, do shortcuts that you do in your Rails uh, model. But, you know, really the question you ask is, do you need to? So when you're using and you're making your API, if you don't have one, you need to really make those conscious decisions that those are the pieces of information your view really needs to actually render. So in this case, we're using JBuilder. Um, you, know, you can use Active Model Serializer from YCATS, or you know, there's several other different ways to render your API. Um, but the idea here was just that you know, our models are huge, right? There's lots of information. So the thing is, um, depending on the perspective you stand, push it to your model if you can and leave those decisions out of your view, because that's just one more thing that's really difficult to test in your view. <clears throat> so isolating your UI. So this was really important for us. Um, we thought of the components that we broke out, those little pills that are expanding and contracting and changing the states. We saw them as, as really isolated components. And this is, uh, in fact, a sub-view. So um, I watched a talk on uh, SoundCloud giving this, and, and they were like, you know, isolate your views down to minimal components, even buttons, you know, could be a different view. And at that time, I thought it was a little crazy. But now I can definitely understand where they're coming from. This is to just change the state from the little spinning to account linked and, and that whole management. So this guy's purpose is just to model, to watch the model 
and update the view when changes happen. And it looks really simple, and it is pretty simple. <coughs> and that's, the, that's actually really great. So it allows you to keep this isolated. One thing that you'll get happening in your views is that you get event craziness. So you're, you'll have things bound to events, and if you don't remove them properly, or you don't have some sort of standard way to remove these events from your DOM if you have to remove them, um, they'll hang around and, and they'll get messed up. Um, the other reason that isolating your views is, is good is the other thing I talked about previously was <coughs> your, ability, your ability to test. So testing your views is really, we, we find it really important. Um, we're using Jasmine to test and we took a lot of time to set up that framework. Um, but this is an example of how we test that view that I was just showing you. So um, you can supply that view, any sort of model you want. Um, you can give it really wherever you want to output. So our output is really where we're going to test that the results of rendering is actually in, you know, so it's actually checking that, you know, this new state is visible versus the other things are, are not visible. <clears throat> so testing and doing those subviews isolated is really, really, really important for us. <coughs> So integration by event. So Backbone is really good, and so is in general your DOM, is really good at communicating through events. And, and so what we found was that we were, we were trying to integrate pieces of our old code into our Backbone components. And we're like, well, what do we do? Do you make them call them statically? Or do you do, you know, there's a lot of ways you can, you can do this. Um, but the kind of ways that the views work is reacting to events, which is really important. So we have um, here our non-backbone code publishing different events um, in which our, our backbone views can listen to and, to and can kind of react to. And we found that that was really important segmentation to happen. And as well, you, you have your backbone collections. You know, so there's no coupling here between your old code and even between some different pieces of backbone code. <clears throat> so in summary, I know I probably spoke kind of fast, but we were a little short on time. Make sure your use case is valid. Um, we're kind of gonna we're gonna kind of go ahead and when it makes sense, you know, that really complicated view, build that out in Backbone. Make sure it's really you know kind of isolated. We're not gonna go replace all of our JavaScript today. We're not gonna go to a one-page app, <coughs> at least not today. Um, but make sure you're organized. You know, you want to minimize replication because that's just another pain point. You know, that you have to test, you have to get get around. Um, you want to isolate your views and make sure that everything is just, you know, that there's clean separation of logic. And then move incrementally. So we don't think it's really reasonable to just take off a couple months, and neither did our product team, to say, you know, well, we want to just rewrite all this stuff, and it'll be a little bit snappier and stuff like that. Um, we didn't want this uh, backbone to be our excuse to make the page faster. There's other ways to make the page faster, caching. And, you know, you can even use PJAX in conjunction with our backbone implementation, and it would actually help, you know, speed up the page probably quite significantly. Skipping. Thanks. So, any questions on that stuff? And uh, yes, sir. Sure. Great question. So he asked um, how many people are were working on this and how long did it take. So, um, we generally do pair programming. So um, we had two people working back and forth. Um, on a proof of concept for a little while. And we kind of implemented a little bit of that. Um, and then we used that and we showed it to the team and the team discussed that. And then we had two more people working on that actual implementation, that video that I showed you. Um, and that probably was about, you know, a couple weeks to a month. So in that with the testing and everything, yeah, we think it went pretty well. Yeah. Uh, I have a question about, so since it's, uh, the app itself is just kind of looking at the end, but still, how do you tackle the security problem? Because since you're showing to Ajax, we are currently using some of the old programs that are not quite correct for the testing. So, what did you do? Uh, so, the question is essentially how do we handle security? Okay, and um, essentially, how do we do that basically with our Ajax calls? So, we still hit all of our controllers, which are all still authenticated through those kind of things. So we didn't really have to do a lot of extra building around it. So we took to heart some of the, the recent conversations. I remember Snippet talked about their tackling, you know, OAuth and that kind of thing and doing authentication through their, their backbone application. And it is a pretty big hairball. That's something that, that shouldn't be taken lightly. And uh, if you can, push it off as much as you can. 
any other questions? Yep. Uh, so the question is, can you use CoffeeScript without Backbone? Oh, do most people? Um, I think a lot of the examples that we saw um, were pretty much CoffeeScript. It makes it a hell of a lot cleaner to look at, and especially the Jasmine tests by far just make it insane to actually look at. So we found it really, really beneficial. We have a question back here, Ben. Oh, okay, go ahead, Brett. Going forward, would you um, advise writing the backbone code um, kind of by itself and not duplicating that functionality in Rails, or would you always um, write everything in Rails first and then kind of replicate it on a single page in Backbone? Uh, that's a good question. So the question is, I, I don't know if I have to repeat that, but should we, repli <laughs> should we replicate the same kind of thing? I guess in, in the view layer, I, I guess is the question, and then would you go ahead and do it in Backbone? Um, so we took the approach to isolate the, the widgets on the client side, and, and we didn't actually render that any of that stuff on the server side. Um, and a lot of that had to do with the way it was transitioning to that page, and it was auto-loading a lot of data. Um, my suggestion, I guess, would be um, do it where it makes sense and, and only focus on that. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to redo the same thing twice just because, you know, out of practice. Um, if you... If you have something that's really dynamic and it needs to be, you know, f moving in and out of the page and, and things like sorting and, and, and stuff like that, I think that's something you should definitely just jump into the page and do that. Um, we we, we tested, or sorry, to expand a little bit, we looked at, you know, doing partials and rendering, I think the Railscast, Ryan Bates had some uh, article on how to share your views, your mustache templates between client side and server side, and um, we found that that was kind of painful and uh, it was just unnecessary for us and I, I don't I think you should kind of you know maybe look away from that thing if you can avoid it yes uh, can you repeat that a little bit louder a gem that will oh uh, Yeah. So the, the question is, uh, is there going to be a gem essentially that's going to help um, do that in the future? And uh, I was going to say the same thing. Um, you can ask David himself if uh, he thinks that will come into Rails 4. Um, my response to that is um, there are a lot of other projects going on that are trying to do a lot more. Like so with Yehuda's uh, work on Ember, I mean, that that is almost to play directly into Rails hand. Um, are they going to pull it into the Rails repo? <laughs> or probably make it a default. I, don't, I think they might, um, but I'm not sure if it's going to be Backbone or Ember. Or... Oh, do we, are we going to support a plugin? Um. I think I don't understand your question. Let's let's talk offline. Okay, thanks. Yes. Uh, so Backbone was our first choice. Um, our second choice was a little bit tough because a lot of the other frameworks had, uh, were very opinionated, which we found wasn't wasn't that great. Um, we probably would have went something on the lines of uh, Ember if we had to, but that would have made a lot of assumptions that maybe we weren't ready to make yet. Yes. Uh, yeah, actually, I would say if if you keep good patterns about you know isolating and keeping things small, um, yes, it, testing is definitely easier. I, I probably wouldn't even begin to understand the pain that we would have had to test that. And and you know to be honest, um, there's a finite amount of time, so we probably wouldn't have tested it as thoroughly as we can today. Yes. So the question was, um, what is what is a view? What is a subview in this instance? So um, the pill itself is one particular view. 
Um, and that's kind of the, the overriding great, bigger view. Um, the subviews that we did, so for instance, that green account or the spinner, um, those are, that's one subview. That was the one I showed the example of. When you expand this, um, there's a couple different things that happen. When you are, the first time you're adding this, you expand it, this is a subview of actions for, it's essentially to create the new, so this is like the new action it would be synonymous with. Um, but later after it's done links um, and you open that up, there's gonna be an edit view. So there's even more, um, you know, sub views that are involved. Um, <clears throat> we, we're discussing what other things to actually, if we go into the granularity of this button needs to be a sub view and things like that. Um, but, you know, there's trade-offs, so you don't wanna go crazy, but you wanna make it easy. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, so the question is, are we using a templating language? Yes, we, we used um, uh, Mustache. We looked at Handlebars, or no, sorry. We're using Handlebars. We looked at Mustache first. Um, and do you have a follow on question? Uh, yeah, we're we're not use uh, the question is are there any backbone plugins that we're actually using? There are uh, actually I, I was very surprised to look through the list of, of backbone plugins. There's a, there's a lot. Um, there we're not using any today. Um, we looked at maybe using a marionette, for instance, to do some some little bit easier binding of your views. But um, no, we're actually we just use straight up backbone and uh, it's one dependency underscore, and then we're off on the, off on the races. So the question is, can we post, I guess, some, some examples of the, jazz, the Jasmine test that we have? <laughs> no, absolutely. So it, it, I, I will be honest, it, it was a little bit of a pain point um, to get a Jasmine test running, Jasmine tests with CoffeeScript, and now Jasmine tests with CoffeeScript and Backbone. So yeah, I mean, we can look to, to put together something to, as an example, and I can post it to the meetup. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, yeah. Any other questions? Sure. So the, the question is, how do we how do we minimize the amount of replication? I guess um, the thing is that if you need to do some sort of sorting or you need to do something in your view, you need to display, you know, a name, or sometimes you need to display a user's custom name over top of the name. Um, those kind of things, you have to make that decision. You have to um, determine. So we we chose to push it up as high as possible, and that's why I was showing the J Builder view. I'll just show that again. Uh, so for this for this one for this instance, um, you use a lot of shortcuts. So like locked credentials, for instance, um, it has a lot of other things behind it. Um, it actually checks several you know um, linked models. Um, and make sure that you know the user's inputs are correct. Um, so we chose to expose it in such a, a simpler way to the view, um, and there's no good rule around it. As long like if you see something in your view that you're not using, I mean, I would try and pull it out as much as possible. So I mean, that, that's the best advice I can give. You just have to be really regimented on that. It's still yes, it's still a manual process. Yes, yeah, it's easier to send on everything, um, but <laughs> that's obviously not not the best case. Any other questions? All right, thank you very much.
All right, so we're going to take just a, a quick five-minute break here if you guys want to grab a beer or something uh, while DHH gets online and go from there. Hey, for everybody who doesn't know, there's also a second room back there where there's more seats, and uh, we'll be taking questions from both side from both rooms. Hello. Oh, hold on a minute. Jim. <laughs> Hi, David. Hey. Uh, we're uh, just taking just a quick break here, and uh, everyone should be recongregated probably in about uh, three minutes or so. And uh, all right, we'll we'll commence then. Sounds good. All right, thank you. Yeah, if we could have everyone return back to their chairs. Like we said, there's room in the back as well. Um, either either side can ask questions, so um, no worries. All right, everybody. So, for uh, for those uh, who don't know, this is David Annemeyer Hansen. He's the creator of Rails, partner at Thirty Seven Signals, uh, best-selling author. And today we're going to discuss the uh, Rails views and how they, how or if they um, work with Backbone JS and his thoughts and such. So. David, maybe if you could start off with like a high-level uh, philosophical view as to what you think about the latest trends in um, the JavaScript frameworks that are emerging, everything from Backbone.js to Ember.js, and what your thoughts are. Sure. So maybe the best way to start is, is to tell a little bit about how uh, the new version of Basecamp came to be, because uh, we recently rewrote uh, Basecamp. It's the original Ruby on Rails application. Um, the application that I extracted Ruby on Rails from, uh, we've been running that application for a good eight years or so. And uh, about uh, a year and a half ago, we decided that we were going to rewrite the whole thing. Uh, we had changed our opinions about what the product was going to be, and we just felt we were 
a lot wiser about uh, how to build web applications than we were eight years ago. So that led us to question how we should build the app. Um, prior to that, I think a year or a year and a half before that, we had built a mobile version of Basecamp Classic, the original Basecamp version, uh, that was built entirely in, um, in JavaScript. Um, it was uh, built with, uh, with Backbone and a bunch of other technologies that uh, Sam Stevenson in particular put together. Um, and we looked at that approach, which was basically uh, client-side MVC, very heavy setup, everything shot back and forth via uh, JSON, uh, just data going across the wire. And uh, I had a chance to, to really examine that, examine that style of programming. Um, and that personal experience basically led me to to think that that's not how I want to spend my time. Um, they've been making great strides. Uh, lots of people have. Uh, creating JavaScript applications today are endlessly better than it was five years ago. So, so that's great. Um, tons of progress been made. But that's not really the yardstick that I measure whether I want to spend my time on something or not. The yardstick is, is the code better, simpler, easier, prettier to write than what I'm writing already now. So that's the first order of comparison. Um, and on that first order of comparison, when I compared writing uh, a regular Rails application using, for first and foremost, Ruby as the primary language, using uh, templates like ERB, um, setting everything up with uh, with action pack and, and generally the whole rail stack from from models to controllers to views um, I intensely enjoy that development experience I mean obviously so I, mean, I, I created a, a bunch of the, the frameworks and continue to contribute to the frameworks 10 years after I begun um, and so I had that on the one side right the, the pleasure of development um, to me, it was not even a, a comparison. Even though I, I'm actually a big fan of, uh, of CoffeeScript in particular, not that thrilled on vanilla JavaScript. Um, it, it's, it's not a very pretty language for me to, to write. CoffeeScript is actually pretty damn good. Um, but still, pretty damn good is, is, is not the yardstick of comparison. The yardstick of comparison, is it better than Ruby? And the answer is unequivocally, fuck no, uh, not even close. And I mean, that's not really much of an insult. I think Ruby is the prettiest programming language ever made. So I mean, obviously, when you're comparing it to, to Ruby, pretty much everything is going to come up looking short. So nonetheless, um, these are two choices we have. It's not like anybody's going to pay us to write CoffeeScript any more so than they're going to pay us to write Ruby. So there's no inherent uh, appeal if you can choose between either to me, at least not on the development side of things. So, so that was the first order of business was figuring out, do I like writing this more? Because if I like writing this more, it, it's easy. Like just let's go. Let's just switch over. Let's write as much as we can using co CoffeeScript, client-side MVC, uh, and all these other things, right? Do, if, if that was a better development experience, we, we could deal with a whole lot of other things, right? So I came to the conclusion that was not the case. Then the, the second order of business was, um, can we do more? Can we do different things? Would giving up Ruby allow us to create a different kind of application that is not possible to, to write using a regular uh, Rails stack? Um, and I think that was a, a very valid question because uh, the style in which we built the original base camp um, is all good and fine, but the responsiveness of new applications that have been coming out built using client-side JavaScript techniques was great in many cases. It made the traditional everything is reloaded on each page feel slow and 
I mean, obviously, as a user, you could just tell the difference. So for me, the mission became, how close can we get? Uh, is this inherent to the heavily JavaScript uh, run applications? Is this something that we simply cannot approach? Will uh, these kinds of applications just inherently be faster than what you can build using a, a standard Rails stack? And that sort of became a challenge for me for the, for the new version of Basecamp. Um, and that led me to sort of investigate a whole bunch of techniques for how to keep my beloved uh, Ruby at the center point of, of the application. And the conclusion I came to was that there are basically two techniques that not only make uh, writing standard style Rails applications as fast and as responsive in the bulk of the cases as, as a client-side setup would be, um, they don't detract from the development experience, which is sort of the whole thing I originally was, was interested in, in finding out. Can we make something that's just as responsive, feels just as good to the user without harming us as developers? Um, and those two techniques are PJAX, which is basically a, um, a very simple JavaScript hack to not reload the entire page with all the assets when you click one link to, to the next. Um, it basically reloads only a, a single container, like a, a div you designate to be the reloadable area, and, and fill that in with um, uh, response coming down, uh, Ajax style, from, from a Rails app that doesn't include the, uh, the layout. Um, that technique alone makes a huge difference in the perceived responsiveness of the application. That the browser does not have to go back and check, oh, did the JavaScript change, did the CSS change, now I have to reevaluate all that uh, JavaScript and, and all that CSS to, to make the paint change. Um, you basically keep the same shell, the same layout active from request to request. So that's already huge. Um, but it wasn't enough. If you just take your standard Rails app uh, and we could just take the, the classic version of Basecamp, um, some of those actions, because of the way we had created uh, the classic version of Basecamp, took a long time to compute um, because we weren't caching a whole lot. So say some of those actions took 200 or 300 milliseconds. Now, some of that was just computing and, and uh, doing all the HTML layouting. Uh, now, you could totally tell the difference between 300 milliseconds and 50 milliseconds. That's a noticeable difference. I mean, when you're comparing these things, there's a lot of other things that take up even more time than that. If you, if you look at a full page request, it can take seconds. So you have to sort of look at what you're comparing. But if you're comparing a JSON request that takes 50 milliseconds and is then fulfilled locally uh, with uh, a client-side JavaScript uh, framework that then renders this using some sort of client-side uh, rendering templates, um, then it's a noticeable difference. And, and it feels like I am giving something up if, if 300 milliseconds is the best I can do. So PGX was the sort of the first order of breakthrough and in my mind the most important of the two. The second order of breakthrough was um, going whole hog on, on caching everything. And I've written this up um, on, on signal versus noise under the, the header of Russian doll caching, which is basically the idea of, of caching um, every logical component of a page nested into each other, um, such that you don't invalidate the entire page when something changes. You just invalidate a little piece of it. Uh, and the, sort of the thing that facilitated that was the whole idea of, of key-based uh, cache exploration. So anyway, it's a very long tale to basically say that the experiment that started as um, can, we, can we get close enough to uh, the responsiveness of client-side MVC using a few simple techniques that allow us to continue to use this 
wonderful development stack that is uh, Ruby and Rails? Um, and the answer, for me at least, was a resounding yes. Um, the responsiveness of, of something like the new version of Basecamp is absolutely on par with uh, the best client-side MVC setups. Now, that is um, an answer that covers about 90 to 95 percent of uh, the new version of Basecamp. There are absolutely cases where you want uh, more complex view behavior where that's just not still not good enough. And to that effect, we still uh, use Backbone as well. Uh, the sort of most obvious example in, in the new version of Basecamp is our calendar. So the calendar in Basecamp is, is very UI heavy, where you do not want to constantly change pages or, or keep all your state in just a DOM. You need actual view models to do that um, in a responsive fashion. So that's an example of where we're basically combining the two things. We're using PJAX to load the shell of the calendar, and then we're instantiating backbone views to actually render that and for the user to interact with that. Um, but what I find to be relieving in, in this kind of setup is that you reserve the use of client-side complexities to just those areas where you just can't get away with anything less. Um, it's kind of like the, the same setup as uh, speed in general. Um, when, when I started doing uh, Ruby and Rails a good uh, a decade ago, things weren't as fast as they were now. I mean, it didn't end up really mattering that much in the end, but if you take another example of an application we have at 37 Signals, uh, Campfire, which is our chat application, um, which is what been around for what six years now six years on it's still using polling so it polls every three seconds are there any new messages for me um, that was an area where those polls which we have about I don't know 2,000 a second or something um, needed to go through something faster right so we rewrote just that little piece originally I think we rewrote it in in C we've tried to it's sort of it's such a small piece of campfire that we've uh, it's kind of been a hoppy um, ground to rewrite it in, in everything under the sun we've rewritten it in Erlang I think we have a version that runs Lua um, it's like it's there's hundred lines and it's just kind of fun to to experiment with that to me backbone views feel the same way they are the optimization when you really need to they are the C rewritten version of a view when you can't get away with um, with, with, what, with what's most enjoyable up front. Um, so that's why I, I really like Backbone versus some of the other more, I don't know if you want to say comprehensive or all-consuming is perhaps a better word, all-consuming client-side uh, stacks which assume that you want to build your entire application like this. Um, I think that's a terrible idea. I think the development experience of building your entire application uh, with these client-side JavaScript frameworks is still not that great. And the primary reason, as we, uh, as I discussed, was uh, you don't get to use Ruby. And I don't. I mean, yeah. All right. So uh, I'll leave that uh, just at, uh, at at that point. Um, so in, anyway, that's basically led me to believe that. Uh, for a very large portion of the types of applications that feel like they're part of the web, that feel like they're not just a recreation of some desktop application, um, the hybrid model of, say, 90 to 95 percent um, regular Rails stack using PJAX and Russian doll caching with 10 to 5 percent dashed in of some sort of backbone or similar setup for those uh, optimizations of views that really need it is the um, optimal path forward. Now, the whole thing has been an interesting debate, right? Because um, Rails has been around for around 10 years. And for a good, what, eight of those or, or, or 
whatever it was until client side MVC JavaScript frameworks really started popping up and gaining traction. Like I didn't see anything that provided uh, for a compelling alternative. Obviously, that's just my opinion of things, and uh, obviously people were using other things, but I think what's interesting now is that the client-side MVC JavaScript setups really do provide a very different um, approach to building applications, and a lot of people are justifiably excited about that. It's something new. I mean, who, who wants to do the same thing for, for 10 years and another 10 years, right? So I think that there's just some, there's some excitement because it's new. It feels like it's a paradigm shift. Um, what I have my beef with is that it seems like a lot of people forgot to compare whether that paradigm shift was, was actually better. Like, I totally agree. It is a paradigm shift. It's a different way of building applications. The real question, though, is, is, is it a better way? Uh, and when is it a better way? And I find that it's a worse way. Um, and, and worse, I define as comparing two pieces of code. Is this more complex or is it simpler? Is it prettier? Is it uglier? Is it, uh, how's the debugging experience? How the, how's the whole development experience of, of doing these things in the browser? And I think it's just still not even close. Again, doesn't mean we shouldn't go there when we have to. It just means that we should, I mean, sort of keep our pants on and, and sort of reserve the level of excitement to, um, to win is a great fit. Anyway, I mean, obviously that's, that's how I feel about it based on my personal development experience of trying both paths and approaches. And I very strongly believe that the hybrid approach that uh, we came up with for, for uh, the new version of Basecamp is, um, is a great general purpose approach that... Um, allows you to, to have uh, the, the wonders of, of, of the Ruby on Rails experience for, for most of the time. And then uh, when you have to, you have to dip down to the, it's actually not that bad, coffee script level of uh, backbone implementations. <laughs> gotcha. So uh, a couple points from that is, one, I think that people would be curious as to what you define as that point where a uh, client-side framework becomes necessary. Like, walk us through when you guys are evaluating the calendar and such. Did you do a PJAX implementation first and then realize that maybe the experience was subpar and then you evaluated that there would be, obviously there's something beneficial at that point and like what are those things that are beneficial? Right, so for, for the calendar in particular, um, we had built a couple before this. Uh, we had built a, a calendar for Backpack and we had built a calendar for, for Basecamp. Um, and we wanted a pretty high level of UI fidelity. Uh, it's stuff like dragging the individual cells and having the cells automatically rewrap when you're moving an event from one day to another or if it's a spanned event. Um, all these sort of little UI details that um, that a calendar makes a calendar feel fluid when you go back and forth between the months. Is it just sort of a fluid animation scrolling between the two things? We basically wanted to give nothing to a local version of iCal. So for that level of interactivity, it felt like a really good fit. Now, if you contrast that to basically the rest of Basecamp, which is, oh, let's view a message thread, um, let's add comments, let's do these things that are more sort of text-based. Um, that's a pretty big difference, right? Like you can totally see, all right, one thing is a very heavily interactive piece of UI machinery, and it has to be sort of neatly put together to, to feel really great. And another thing is more of an informational, um, communication sharing, da 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 model, right? And then in the middle between those two, you have something like a to-do list, right? Um, we built both versions for the to-do list because the to-do list, it wasn't clear. Like, is it actually better? Can you get better feel for how the to-do list were going to work if you did it on client-side MVC or, or can you get by without it? So we built both versions. And the not client-side MVC version one 
it won because it reached the same level of fidelity. You didn't give anything up on the UI side. We made it just as smooth, just as fluid. Um, and the code was much simpler. Uh, it was much easier to write. It was much quicker to write. It was much um, quicker and easier to read. It, it was just better code, right? So to me, that's really what the comparison boils down to in most cases. Um, because it's so easy to get dragged into this philosophical uh, debate back and forth, which is better, which is worse, when you don't have to. I mean, philosophical debates are, are great, and then you look at the code and find out you're wrong, because the code just doesn't lie. Um, I found that the most reasonable people have a tendency to, to agree more often than not when they're looking at the same piece of concrete code and you're comparing two versions and you can just look at it. it it's, it's sort of uh, inherently obvious from, its, from, from just the, the text on the screen, which is more complex, which is more convoluted. And it, it, just, it, isn't a, it isn't much of a fight. Because I think the problem with the sort of backbone is in, in many ways the sort of the, the easier, the lower level version of a lot of these client side MVC frameworks. It, it, in my opinion, it have a tendency to only get worse from there. Um, and, and even when you compare it to that level, it's just, it's pretty complex to make uh, most things work when you compare them to the simplicity of ERB looping over some divs or P's in, uh, in a Rails view. So that's really my standard of comparison for these two things. Uh, and I think that, that it would serve people well to adopt that standard of comparison. And, and I think the hoopla and the disagreements would die down considerably because we would, we would tend to be in closer agreement when we're not arguing in the abstract, but arguing in the concrete. Interesting. So taking a, a, a I, I'm, I'm curious as to when you guys are having these discussions and such, um, just, just in general about your code, when did you decide that the, a complete rewrite was, was uh, necessary versus just like a, a refactoring of, of the previous code base? And you know, what was your criteria for determining that? Sure. So there's a sort of a well-established uh, um, notion in, in software development that uh, the grand rewrite or the big rewrite will always fail. I completely agree with that. If all you're interested in doing is writing the same application again in whatever flavor of the day technology is available, you are likely to fail. There's a ton of institutional knowledge um, embedded in long-term code bases. Like, it took us eight years to build Basecamp Classic and fix all the bugs for that set of functionality. So if we were just going to build exactly the same application that did exactly the same thing one more time, it would be a utter and grand waste of time. So our criteria for determining whether a rewrite was worth it or not was, are we actually going to do something different? Are we going to come up with a different application? And for us, the answer was yes. We were going to make different choices. Uh, we were going to implement the same broad strokes of an idea for Basecamp, for example, managing projects. Managing projects is an incredibly broad problem domain. And people solve that in a myriad of ways. So even though perhaps on the surface that the two versions look similar, there are tons of choices that are just different. We made different calls and we came up with a different with a different product. And then it's not so much of a rewrite. Then it's more of a, is this worth it? Is this different set of um, trade-offs and features that we've implemented, is that better than the old one? Are people gonna like it more? Um, so for, for the new version of Basecamp, we set us some criteria. One being it had to be unbelievably fast. Uh, we wanted to leave nothing or, or let nothing be left behind for similar applications implemented in exactly client-side MVC frameworks. That if, if some competitor was going to basically make Basecamp and just make it as client-side MVC, we didn't want the user to be able to tell that there should be nothing 
that they had on us in terms of speed. And I think we absolutely accomplish that. That's why I'm so bullish on this stuff because it's not like I'm sitting in my room thinking these thoughts. We're trying them out in the, in the marketplace. We're letting real users determine is this um, fast enough, is it good enough? Because I mean, when people pay you money to, to use your product, the, the verdict is incredibly harsh, much harsher than any uh, would-be discussion thread on Hacker News of the pros and cons of uh, uh, shipping your shit back and forth in JSON or HTML. Um, like that's just wanking. Uh, people putting their credit card down and, and deciding to pay you or pay somebody else, now that's where uh, reality will hit you smack in the face. So I, I think uh, people would be curious as to possibly see some of these features um, with uh, potentially you just kind of giving an overview of maybe like the to-do list and such and sure. a potential uh, just discuss some of the, the surrounding implementation details and things. Yeah, let me actually um, see how I can do that. Let me just set up a... Um, One second here. Okay. Um, can you guys see this? Yep. All right. So this is basically the uh, base cam we have set up for the Rails core team. Um, and it has a, a couple of projects here, um, the main one being Rails 4, some of the features we're discussing that we want to, to make and include. Um, all this is uh, these to-do lists we were talking about. Um, we have a bunch of discussions here back and forth about inviting people or certain features that we want to include. Um, and all this you see me click back and forth. It's a little hard to see when you do it over video, but if, if you've tried this, um, on your own machine or something, it feels really fast. Like the the sheet you see here jumping back and forth, that's, this is all PJAX. So when I click any of these links, this shit up here is not being reloaded. Um, if uh, like the, the JavaScript and the CSS is not being reloaded when I click these links, which is why it's so um, fast. Um, now, if you take the, the to-do list here, for example, this dragging back and forth, it's just, uh, I think we use sortable or something. It, even, I think it's just from the, the, the jQuery setup. Um, this is not a client-side MVC thing. It's, uh, we have a hook. When I drag this and I drop it, uh, it's going to send just a regular AJAX request back to the server saying, um, you moved it to this position, it's going to be updated. Uh, one of the things that's actually interesting here is what we also do is um, we have live updates. So if somebody else was viewing the same project with me and I dragged this down to here, they were going to see that on their screen. How do we ac accomplish that? Well, every single action here that's an AJAX action, for example, me clicking edit right now, it turns into this uh, uh, form instead. Um, at least in a bunch of places, I can't even actually remember whether it's the case here. We make an AJAX request to the server. The server replies with basically um, JavaScript that includes the HTML template for this form. It's rendering this again um, and inserting it right here, right? So that's the same thing we have when I, for example, if I clicked, um, or we're done with uh, concerns, for example. You see how it moved down here? That was a JavaScript reply saying, update this list and insert it down in this list. That reply on, on Basecamp Next can be sent to multiple people. We basically record that in a, uh, in a storage and can send it to multiple people listening to it in a similar fashion to actually how Campfire works, and, and, and we use polling for that even. Um, oh. oh, actually we did finish this. It's just showing one at a time. Um, so this is an example of just this uh, a piece of moderate interactivity here um, where we did not need to go the whole client-side MVC way. 
So let me show you the other example, at the other end of this. This is the, uh, the calendar. Um, there's actually nothing on the calendar right now. We could add something here, uh, something, and we can make it last multiple days. So now it has this um, spanned event, right? When we drag this around, we have this nice little effect. If I had another event here, uh, let's make that last multiple days too. Um, these things just, they feel nice, right? They feel like it's a desktop application. And to get this sort of sense and feel of, uh, of that level of interactivity, uh, the sort of whole hog, client side MVC, backbone of the wazoo approach to things worked out really well. Um, this is a heavy piece of, of interactivity and, and I think it makes, makes perfect sense in that way. It took much longer to build than anything else because building these kind of things are just far more complex. Um, but it was worth it because uh, we wanted that level of interactivity. Now for most everything else, um, it's not worth it. For most of these things, it's just an information page. There's not heavy interactivity going on here. It's just not worth having that level of fidelity. Thus, it's not worth expending the amount of energy and time it takes to build this kind of stuff using um, very time and labor intensive building techniques, uh, which to me is an absolute no brainer when you sort of, you have these uh, high fidelity techniques that are great when you need really high fidelity interaction and then don't use them when you don't need that. That's the kind of stuff that just frustrates me a little bit that sort of you find your shiny new tool, right? And, and you're so excited because now we can build calendars like this that feel really great. And you get so excited that you want to build everything like that, even shit like this that's just a fucking discussion with the comments. I mean, we've been building these things since the beginning of time. Um, they don't need that level of finesse um, because the only argument you can make there is speed, right? Oh, we can make this fast because we're just sending JSON back and forth. And the, the truth is no. You can make this just as fast sending HTML back and forth. And, in many ways, it's actually faster because you have less freaking JavaScript code spinning its wheel on the client side. You can cache this stuff between um, users, right? When, when I'm viewing this page right now, uh, if Jeremy actually comes in and looks at the same to-do list, he's getting the same cache HTML versus when you're just sending JSON down to the client, every single time anybody views it, it has to be recompiled as the templates and the templates shown again, right? Um, that's just, it's not efficient and it's not that fast. It's fast compared to the old school eight years ago way of how we would have built Basecamp with no or little caching and everything reloads on every request. But that's not, um, uh, that's not the comparison. The comparison is there, we have better ideas and better, better tools. The primary ones among those two being PJX and caching. Anyway, is there anything else you guys would want me to, to, to show you here in terms of uh, uh, I think it's I think it's interesting to just see the payloads that's returned and uh, oh yeah actually okay, just let's look at the payloads because that's actually awesome. I fucking hate this new <laughs> web inspector <laughs> piece of shit, but anyway, we'll make do. Um, Got push course here. So let's go to discussions. So you see, it was an. Can you guys even see this? Is the font even big enough here? Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, sort of. I, kind of. Yeah. All right. Enough. So I, 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 when I clicked that, this new sheet that popped up here was a Ajax request XHR here, and it requested this topics page. And if you see, this is the HTML that's actually. I wonder if I can make it bigger. No, I can't. This is the HTML being returned. It doesn't have a body tag. It doesn't have an HTML tag. It's just the shit that goes inside the container. Like if we look at, um, so you see it starts here, container, stack container. If I inspect this guy, 
you see the let's see where we have it uh, stack container this is the stuff from here that's being replaced this stuff up here this just stuff is just being left behind like all the stuff that's in the head all this stuff that we've set up it is not being changed and that's what makes it so fast you're not recompiling uh, and reloading and reinterpreting all the JavaScript every time and you're not um, the same with the CSS and, and much of the HTML frame. You're just sending those um, small bits back and forth. Well, let me show you something more interesting. Let's do, uh, let's actually start a new project. How do I actually go back to, oh, there we go. I wonder how I can clear this shit out. Uh, I can't. Uh, uh, actually, here's another good example. So here, for example, we have a little piece of somewhat high interactivity um, because we have this stuff with um, autocomplete, right? And it'll know even stuff like this. Like you can name a group and it'll show it up. This is actually built with a little piece of backbone. So the little piece of backbone actually does, in this case, request just JSON. This invites um, JSON that where it's just the data coming back and forth. And we're building this piece of interactivity with backbone because then we get these nice little things where, where nothing being stored. And it just made sense for that case, right? But if we, for example, do this, like I submit this project now. Let's go back to the, I wonder how I can clear, how can I clear this list? Uh, I don't know. I use Chrome. Fuck, I hate it. Um, anyway, I'll create it now. All right, great. So I hit, let's see, projects. Um, and actually, when I created that thing, it just sent back saying, go to this page. Let's, let me show a better example here. Uh, scroll down, and we will add a new, not a discussion, actually. We'll add a to-do list. Great. So, to-do list. This is perfect. So, I submitted this form. You guys saw, like, this is a new list, blah, blah, blah. I submitted. What do I get back? I get JavaScript back. This is basically RJS. RJS without the Ruby to JavaScript conversion. Yes, we just wrote it like this in JavaScript on the client side, but the pattern is the same. The pattern is that you send down... Um, JavaScript that's then being evaluated instead of sending down JSON and then building this shit out of local templates. What's happening here is first, um, if there was a, a empty holdup, yeah, whatever, that doesn't even matter. What matters is we have this placeholder uh, UL to do list in the code. In here, I rendered the new to do list. You see this stuff? This is all coming from an uh, Rails template, which is exactly the same template that I'm going to use when I click reload here. When I reloaded the whole thing, this template, that was the same thing we sent down the wire, which means that I can reuse the same templates both as responses to Ajax actions and as the initial first order render, which is a huge gain um, because one of the problems with this sort of client-side rendering is what do you do in the first render? Do you build everything from, from, Java, uh, from JSON from scratch? You pretty much have to do that because otherwise you have to maintain the same template both on the client side and on the server side. And I mean, therein lies madness. You don't want to maintain the same template in sort of two different systems, right? Um, anyway, let me do this again. Actually, maybe I can clear it out. No, I can't. Oh, there we go. So here I'm submitting a new to-do item. It does the same thing. Um, it finds the to-do list it belongs to. It appends HTML that's been rendered at the server from the same template. Um, and then it, it does some other stuff, like uh, it focuses on the new field that's there so you can enter a new one, right? You can do all this work um, just as a regular 
Rails template. Actually, let me switch over and I'll show you exactly how this code looks. Um, let me switch over the screen share. Can you see this code? Yes. All right, great. So this is a create JS ERB. So it's a response to an action, right? Actually, maybe it became a little too big here. Um, and you can see the key point here is here, I'm rendering that new to-do. It's rendering the to-do template. I can look that up. Um, this is the template that we're using to both render it originally and as in a response to when we're creating something new. And as you can see up here, I'm doing this little cache to do, which means that as I'm rendering the template for its first response to, to my action of adding one new uh, to do, I'm also caching that entire view such that when anybody else comes and see this to do list, they will just hit my cache, um, which is really the magic of this Russian doll caching setup, right? that the to-dos are cached, the to-do list is cached, the project page is cached, and it's all nested neatly inside of, uh, inside of each other. Any, any questions to how this uh, stuff works? Or, um... uh, audience, any questions? I, I think some of the key points there are to look at uh, like your form for and how it's setting the remote flag a true and um, you would also probably see that maybe like on a, uh, potentially on a link to or something like that. But so the key point is that setting that remote to true makes it an Ajax request. And then in your respond to block, um, you're probably just responding to like a, a format.js, which yep. would render. As you can see here, I have my form for creating a new to do. Like this is the wonder of this shit. It's the same stuff we've always done, right? There's nothing new here. This is the same nice, comfortable way of, of writing views, and they can be used to create these kinds of, I mean, super fast and super interactive feeling applications. I can even, let me open the to-do's controller here, too. We have a question from the back here. Uh, when you okay, uh, yeah, go ahead, Brett. Hi there. Uh, my question is about validation. Um, ever since we uh, stopped posting and rendering errors on a model uh, and having more responsive validation in JavaScript, um, no matter how you do it, whether you're hitting the server or doing it purely in JavaScript, um, it's really painful because we're duplicating oftentimes uh, validation logic from the uh, active record models. So I was wondering if you could give us some hope for, uh, for uh, uh, helping this pain point. Yeah, so I say first, first I'll say that I've largely and we've largely at 37 signals moved away from validations because I think that validations suck. Making a user fill out a template and then throwing a ton of errors back at him sucks. So if there are any possible ways that you can redo your UI in such a way that it doesn't uh, require such a fine-grained set of rules to satisfy it, if you can do more work on your side to, to make sure that the, that's not necessary, that's totally better. But I agree, it doesn't solve all the, all the cases all the time. One thing you can do is, you see this, uh, this create action, you can have all your validation rules happen um, as a server response. It doesn't have to happen on the client side to feel client side. Because when you submit this thing, the response coming back is just JavaScript, right? You're not reloading a page that's gonna make, just gonna feel super slow and take forever. You're just sending back a set of uh, jQuery instructions. And those responses could just as well come off a, um, a failed validation as they could come on the success state. Like what we're looking right now, the template you're looking at right now is the success state. But you could have sent back the, the failure state. Um, but uh, I, I've just, I've not really cared that much anymore because we've sort of, the designers at 37 Signals have decided, and I completely concur, that getting a list of like, oh, here are the seven problems with your form is a shitty way to 
make an application because nobody wants to look at seven errors on their form. So coming up with smaller forms or forms that take a wider array of data or otherwise are more resilient to the different types of user input um, is better. So I, I, it sort of, I, it doesn't quite answer your question, it's sort of just saying redesign your application um, to make it hurt less. David, is it possible that you can show some of your code for the um, Russian doll caching? And yep, so we can absolutely. See kind of yeah, so it's, I mean, it's so simple it's almost offensive because you're looking at it right now. So now we're in a to-do, right? The only thing I need to do here is I, um, I'm using... Zoom in a little bit and that would be great. There you go. Thank you. Okay. So the, the first operating thing here is I'm caching this entire to-do, right? Uh, the only uh, input I'm using to that cache is, uh, obviously I'm doing key-based expiration. So I'm caching off the to-do. To-do will actually call, when I just pass to-do to cache, we'll call cache key. And cache key is basically to-do ID dash to-do updated at which means that when this to-do is updated, updated at is touched, which means that the whole key changes, which means that the cache expires. So that's the magic of uh, key-based expiration, right? There's, there's no tracking in your code of, oh, how do I invalidate all these caches? Now, here comes the second wonderful part. The second wonderful part is the to-do list. Uh, find that. I'm caching that, right? So now I'm saying, let's see where we have it. I'm saying render these to-dos. Here's the collection and here's the to-dos I'm rendering. That's rendering to-dos like this, right? When those renders hit the fact that this has already been cached, it's not rendering it. It's just fetching the cache. So say you have a to-do list of, of 10 items, right? All those 10 items are cached. When I call this, I'm asking for 10 pieces of cache instead of actually computing this whole fucker and, and rendering it every time. So that's fast. Now the to-do list is cached. So we bubble up one level, right? If you go back to the, um, uh, actually, let's go back to it, to the project to-do list. Here's the, um, uh, template that includes all the to-do lists that are shown on the front page of a, of, a, um, of a project. You see, I'm going to do, yeah, here I'm calling render sortable, but does the same thing. It basically renders all those to-do lists, like those, the first 10 to-do lists are being rendered. All those 10 to-do lists are cached, and all of the to-dos inside of those to-do lists are cached. And they're all bound up on this cache key saying, to-dos updated at. And if I go all the way to the top level, let me show you that. Uh, the project is cached. So now you have your Russian doll, right? You have to-dos inside to-do lists, inside an index of to-do lists, inside a project. And it's all cached all the way up. And the way this works is if I touch a to-do, let me load the to-do for you. If I touch the to-do, it belongs to a to-do list that will be touched when this to-do is touched. If I go to the to-do list, that belongs to a project, and I will touch this to-do's updated at. So you can see when I touch and change a to-do, I'll invalidate all the way up my Russian doll, right? I will unravel it, but only at that level where it makes sense. So just because I'm touching one to-do, it doesn't invalidate the caches of all the other to-dos on the list. Yes, I'm invalidating the to-do list, the one to-do and the to-do list and the, the project, right? But once that cache needs to be recomputed, the to-do list, when that renders itself, will take the nine caches of the to-dos that weren't invalidated, just render the one new to-do, and so on and so forth, right? So that's how the shit is just super duper fast because you never really invalidate very much of your, your caching surface. Um, so you're not re-rendering your caching surface all the time. 
And so how are you handling it when you roll out a new version of the, the particular, uh, say the view has been updated and, yes. and that, the object hasn't been touched? That used to totally suck. What I used to do was this. So I used to do this to describe that this is version one of my, of my to-do. And then I would do this. This is version one of my to-do list. And then let's just go all the way up here. And this would be my version one of my project, right? Now say I change my, my to-do. I change something in here. This is wrapper uh, papper, right? So now I have to invalidate every single cache that includes that. So the first thing I'll do is I'll invalidate this, right? So now the to-do caches are, are all updated. Oh, shit. These caches are all cached inside other caches, which means I have to also update my to-do list because they include the to-do caches. Oh, shit. My project includes all these to-do lists. I also have to update my, my project. This totally fucking blows. <laughs> um, and it gets even worse. I had cases where you would update something else in some uh, shared piece of uh, uh, partial that was used six different places and you had to remember where all that shit was being kept. Thankfully, we've, only, we've just come up with that solution. I basically just pushed a gem like three days ago uh, called CAS Digests, which will automatically take a digest of my template file uh, and append that to the cache. So basically what this cache gets expanded to is uh, MD5, well, MD5 of this template. So if I change this, the MD5 is no longer the same. The MD5 changed, which means my cache changed. Now, I still have the problem, right? I still have the, the uh, Russian doll problem. I just changed my cache, so now my to-do know I'm new, but my to-do list does not know I'm new. We solve that too by not only are we emptifying the template source, we're also looking through the template source and finding any dependencies of renders. So if you see this render guy down here, the cache digest will basically examine that template source, find the cache digest or find all the render calls and see, oh, this template depends on this template. So I will include the digest of the to-do template inside the to-do list digest. All right? So it basically means whenever I change any template down the rabbit hole of my Russian doll structure, all, temp all other templates that depend on that template are all automatically updated too. And yes, it's fucking magical and it's completely awesome because it means that you don't have to maintain these versions anymore. You just make your changes as you see fit and uh, the system just automatically figures it out. Uh, I think we have a question from the audience. So you're examining the static code, but what if you're dynamically selecting your partials? Yes, that happens all the time. Let me show you one example here. Uh, do, 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 do. We have that. Oh, we have it in project templates. No project to do list. You see this guy? He's rendering to do list, right? I can't infer it. So this is what I do. These are basically helper comments. This template dependency will explicitly say that this call actually is a dependency on the to do list. Now, I just went through the entire code base of. Uh, the new version of Basecamp to basically switch to this new style. We used a unreleased uh, plugin before called Cache Versions, which did something similar, but where you had to maintain all these dependencies yourself by hand and increment these versions by hand. Uh, I had to put in this line, I think, about four times in the entire code base. Everywhere else, the automatic inferring uh, worked. Nice. But and this, this is the out. This is the out. This is how you ensure that you can always declare your dependencies even when I can't uh, extract them from your source. Oh. I have a hard time. 
we, we're having a hard time reading the uh, the actual template dependency comment. So, oh. is there. that better? Yep. It's basically just a comment. Like there's nothing magic to it. And so this is something that's going to be included in Rails four, I assume. Absolutely. And uh, the um, plugin is out now. You can use it with your Rails two application today. It's called Cache underscore Digests. And once you include that plugin, all calls to cache inside um, inside your templates will automatically append this uh, template digest and uh, do the whole Russian doll tracking of dependencies for you. But yes, this plugin is going to be a part of Rails 4. OK, um, let me turn it over to the audience and see if there are any questions. Um, got someone in the back. I wondered if uh, there are any uh, client-side caching techniques you can take advantage of with this uh, server-side caching as well. Yep, absolutely. Um, so what I found is uh, HTTP is just such a wonderful protocol, and it already declares a, a bunch of really helpful things for caching. Uh, most importantly, e-tags and um, uh, if modified since. And we actually have a, a another t um, plugin that's called eTagger. It's also going to be included in Rails 4, where you can basically make uh, um, your controller action eTags dependent on the versions in your uh, templates as well. And eTags are just wonderful things. Um, you, you bind them to the things that uh, you invalidate on, and you can return 302s instead of returning any HTML at all. So that's the combination. What we're not really doing is we're not using any, um, let's say, HTML file, local storage, or any of those other things to store full-on fragments of things. Uh, I find that uh, HTTP already has you covered. If you do well by ETAG and last modified, you're golden. And let me show you one example of how, for example, we use that. Uh, yeah, you can see, for example, this show action here. Render if stale. Uh, we recently upgraded stale and fresh when to just take a whole uh, record. Um, so this is going to uh, basically only render if, if you're not sending an e-tag or last modified flag that, uh, that matches. Nice. And so, Brett, do we have a question in the back? I just thought I saw... I'll ask a question. Okay. Um, David, I was wondering if you could give us any insight uh, into the stacker uh, engine that you guys uh, rolled yourselves? Um, what makes it special uh, versus just a you know, vanilla PJAX? Um, yep. Why did you decide to do that? I will show you instead of telling you. Uh, one second here. All right. You see the browser again, right? OK, so PJX is, or uh, Stacker is basically our expanded version of PJX tailored specifically to our UI design in the new version of Basecamp. And it does stuff like this. So Stacker is based on this nesting metaphor where you have multiple sheets and where it remembers the last thing in your stack. That's basically where the name comes from, right? You can see a stack of papers here. You have to forwardmost sheet, then you have a sheet behind it, and then you have a sheet behind that. And Stacker does sort of clever things like, um, actually, it does do some uh, uh, client-side storing, but just in the DOM. So when I go back here, it doesn't reload this page. It'll show, you, it'll show me what I just came from uh, instead of fetching it from the server. It'll also fetch it from the server because it's looking for updates, but it makes it feel much more responsive because as soon as I click, uh, the page is there. The same thing when I go back here, right? That's why this feels like almost unnaturally fast, uh, and it feels local because it, in some instances it actually is local. 
And then it does other clever things like you see that change where we went from the stack to basically now we're on a flat background uh, that doesn't have that underlay on, uh, under it. Um, that stagger as well as stagger has some rules for displaying different types of, uh, of UI like that. So the, I mean, the magic of stacker is, is really tied to how the UI design of the new base cam works, but the principle of stacker is PJAX. Like what makes it feel fast is, is just, uh, it's just PJAX. There's nothing magic in it, it like that. So it's not like we're holding back some, performance tech or whatever. Um, but we've decided we're not going to open source Stacker because it's our UI look and feel. So that would be like open sourcing the Basecamp icon to us. Um, but I mean, I'm, I'm all about these techniques and, and, and Stack or uh, PJAX, which uh, the GitHub guys uses PJAX vanilla um, and they're maintaining the plugin and it's great. I mean, it, it, it's what's making a bunch of uh, actions on GitHub feel uh, really fast. And, and they don't need the stacker setup because they don't have a stacker UI. Great, thank you. So I know we wanted to keep this to about an hour. So we have uh, one more question here. And we can maybe take one more from the back room if anyone wants it. But uh, here's a question. Hi, first off, thanks for doing this talk. It's been a thrill to have you. Uh, thanks for Rails and all the rest. And my question is, when are you guys at 37 Signals going to move out to San Francisco? <laughs> are you just trying to uh, poke some troll bear here? Because um, uh, I, I don't think that's going to happen. It's actually kind of funny because um, I love the West Coast. Um, I actually have a, a plan to myself move out to uh, to the West Coast uh, in, in not too long. Um, but I don't care too much for a lot of the... Um, how can I put this in, a, in the nicest possible way? Uh, let's say the atmosphere of, uh, of how technology companies are formed and, uh, and, and, and disluted uh, out there. Um, that, that's, that's not my style of business. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, I mean... Can, I, I can we know. ask a follow-on question to that? If you're, a, if you're a developer, what do you recommend when choosing maybe a technology company or a project to work with? What should you look for? Uh, I think you should look for something that personally interests you, and in my mind, you should look for something that's sustainable. It all depends on what you're trying to do, obviously, but I find that at least personally and the people I work with um, do better work when they work for sustainable companies. Um, that's not to say you can't do great work for shit that's going to be gone in 18 months, but um, I find that uh, teams gel better when they don't have a time bomb uh, taking underneath them. So uh, a bunch of the people I work with at 37 Signals who are also Rails core contributors, I've worked with for like five years or more. Jeremy Kember, Sam Stevenson, James Buck, uh, a bunch of these guys I've had the pleasure of working with for a really long time. And that's a luxury you get when you have a sustainable company. Um, so I would look for that, and then I would also look for companies that are sort of enlightened about how they collaborate. Um, to me, you do not fall in the enlightened camp if you require everybody to be in the same office at the same time. I think that's an absolutely antiquated uh, way of building a company consisting of the best people. If you look at 37 Sickles, we have about 11 people in Chicago maybe eight of them come to the office every day, and we have a total of 35. The only way we've been able to assemble such a star team is because we've not confined ourselves to hiring just uh, who can walk to our office or drive to our office. Um, if, if you look at those people I just mentioned, uh, um, Pratik uh, is in, in London, Sam Stevenson is in Chicago, James is in Idaho, Jeremy is in Arizona. Um, would I have turned down working together with uh, wonderful developers like that just to find somebody who, I mean, could sit at my lap uh, because they were in the same office? Fuck no. So, uh, yeah, I guess those would be my criteria. Work on cool shit with cool people for as long as possible. So, 
Awesome. Well, uh, I think that'll probably wrap it up. And uh, just wanted to say thank you for for uh, joining us in this session. And uh, it's been a blast. All right, my pleasure. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. That pretty much wraps it up for a uh, meetup.